my laptop died. <laughs> okay, I'll save it. He was like, export as image. Yeah, right when you finish this. Yeah. Is it fine? <laughs> yeah, you can just uh, oh. put it up there. Mm -hmm. Is it fine to be hibernation, so it's totally fine. Out. 
Um, on Tuesday, I showed you the CDC 6600, which was the first supercomputer. Supercomputers like that really don't exist anymore. People aren't building what used to be called big iron. Um, the 360s, the CDCs, the Crays kind of don't exist anymore. Um, in the classes after the midterm, we're going to be talking about instruction set architectures and looking inside the data paths of different machines. And I'm going to talk about three main architectures at that point. One is something called MIPS. That's an example of what's called a RISC processor, a reduced instruction set, um, popular in the early to mid 80s. And the idea was make your hardware really, really simple. Okay? Keep your instruction set really simple and just do everything in software. Pretty cool idea, um, very easy to design and architect. That's the reason we're going to mostly concentrate on MIPS, because it's a very simple architecture inside. Um, and there were some machines that, that um, were built with that architecture. They don't exist anymore. Um, a second architecture we'll talk about is the VAX, which I've already mentioned a few times. The VAX was, I think, the most fantastic computer architecture ever. Um, it was designed with tight integration between the software and the hardware. There were two teams, and they were working together, allegedly locked in a hotel somewhere in California for a week. Um, there's instructions that are used exactly once in the entire operating system. But they were put into the hardware architecture specifically to support this one operation that the operating system needs to do very frequently, um, swapping from one process to another. Everything was tightly integrated, and it's, it's a beautiful instruction set. And those don't exist. The company that made it doesn't exist anymore. They were bought by Compaq. Okay? And the other architecture we'll talk about is x86, okay, Intel. And this, of course, is the dominant architecture you find in, in PCs, um, AMDs, Intel, they're all x86 architecture. It's kind of a crazy instruction set. It's sort of random looking. It's a nightmare to try to use. You can't really do things efficiently in it. But it's, it's the one that survived, okay? And it's the one that's driving, you know, the 30th largest supercomputer in the world right now. Um, and it's not the best architecture. It's not the best instruction set. Um, the reason the x86 survived, the one word answer. Okay, it's all economics. Um, risk processors were a really nice idea. They didn't catch on. Okay, they were being used. Yeah. So how does ARM compare? To ARM is ARM is up and coming. ARM is actually a risk architecture. It's similar to MIPS, and ARM has found its niche in the portable market. So cell phones and, and some tablets and things like that are using the ARM processor. And the book talks about ARM. We'll probably touch on it a little bit, um, but I'm not familiar with it uh, myself. So um, we'll just sort of go over it briefly. But same thing. That's becoming a popular. Architecture. I think the book says in 2008 they shipped um, ARM inside 3 billion devices. Okay, that's pretty good volume. Comes back to this. Okay, you don't have to be the best. You have to be the one that dominates the market. Okay, and that's not always the one that's the best or the cleverest or the most extendable or the fastest. It's the one that's the cheapest. And the way you get cheap is by dominating the market. So it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. But Intel was there in the beginning of the PC generation, and it was in the first PCs. It stayed with every PC, and um, you know now I think Apple's are using Intel. Is that right? Yeah. They switched off of uh, what they were on before. So if you do something enough, you can make it really cheap. Okay. Think about designing an integrated circuit. How are you going to grow a crystal of pure silicon? That's a nightmare. How are you going to build a filtration system for the clean room? How are you going to sew together the bunny suits that the people need to wear? I mean, there's all these things. It's a really expensive process. If you're doing billions or trillions of dollars in sales, that startup cost is minuscule. Okay? If you're not doing that kind of sales, the startup cost of building a VAX is huge. Okay? And unless you've got the market volume, those costs end up killing you. And that's why most of these companies just haven't survived. And companies that have gotten into the, uh, the popular devices, they're doing well, and, and those architectures are surviving. So it's not always the best or the most clever. It's, it's um, largely comes down to economics. Think about it. If you want to make a molded white plastic chair in China, 
put it on a boat and ship it over to the U.S., you can sell it for five dollars and make a profit. Right? How does that work? It's volume. You just got to be doing enough of them, and the little bit of profit you make overcomes the upfront costs. So you get WalMarts and stuff. What we tell markets eighty six is they know about more efficiency because it's what they do. Um, they they certainly have you know huge research departments and they certainly um, are capable of, of building other systems. But what would they build? They could build something um, if they change the instruction set. All the software up to now breaks. Okay, so they've sort of been bound by the original instruction set, certainly back in the 8086, possibly before, um, and that sort of defines the architecture in some ways. Um, they do change the architecture. They they add more cores. They um, they add deeper pipelines. They do branch prediction. Okay, the architectures have changed, but it's all coming from that one line. Um, and if they change that line, if they decided to start building boxes or something, it would be a completely different product. And all the software, all the peripherals that are out there, all of the um, the devices that came around when clones started being made suddenly wouldn't work, and they would be shooting themselves. Okay, they would lose that position that they're in, where they basically they're the thing that drives every device on the market, in the PC world. Um, and I think that's a bit of a problem. I think it, it can stifle innovation in some ways because there may be a completely different architecture that's fundamentally better that nobody is ever going to develop. Right? They'll come out from small research groups and universities and such, but it'll never become commercially viable because the bump in the beginning of the, the um, cost effectiveness curve is just too big. So it's a bit of a, uh, a double edged thing. But on the other hand, High volume is nice because then we get laptops and cell phones and things like that. So this will drive a friend crazy, by the way, because you can't click on anything. You can't like uh, move this around and all of that. Because it's actually just a screenshot I made. So. <laughs> all right. Um, before I go back to shift and rotate, I just wanted to make a couple of comments on state machines based partially on um, some interactions I had with some of you. Um, two comments. Number one, when you build a state machine like what we've been describing, if you're going to implement it on like logic sim or something where you want to like see how it operates, you need to have a way to initialize the system to set the first state to be turned on. Okay, and I talked to a few of you in email and basically an easy way to do that is to take a button and wire it up to um, there's usually a set input on these flip-flops. On the Ds, it's labeled a 1. Um, if you put a line to that and then just toggle that button, turn it on, turn it off, that'll set the initial state, and that'll get the whole thing running. Um, if you don't have a way to do that, then nothing's going to happen. Um, I also commented on the, the Angel site that you need to turn on the enable line on these flip-flops. Somebody pointed out that you don't need to do that, so I don't know why I thought it was necessary, but if you leave the enable line just floating, it seems to still be enabled. So. Based on the toggle ones, my I did it too, because I was trying the ones that you did with the toggle, mm -hmm. and I definitely needed that one there. So okay, I'm maybe that's sure. where I generalized from. Because on the D flip flop, I try it again, and it looks like you do not need to enable it. Yeah. So maybe it's just on the toggle. I don't know. It never hurts to enable it. It's just extra wires. But um, feel free to just you know drag one of these things off, hook some wires up to it, and experiment, and figure out exactly what the piece is doing. You can also change the characteristics of all of these. There's a little drop-down box under the list of libraries, and you can change the rising edge, falling edge, level triggered edge, triggered, and some of those, um, not the flip-flops, but other gates say, do you want to have enable inputs or not? I think the multiplexers give you a choice. So you can get differences like that. Where is that? Um, Out. 
uh, this window down here. Yeah, but try on the um, flip-flops. I don't think on flip-flops it gives you the option, but on multiplexers it does. But you can set rising edge, falling edge. Um, okay, you can't set what it's like. But you can't turn off the enable. But on the D flip-flop, you can um, you can also set it to be level edged. Oh. Do you want to change when it's high or low, or do you want it to activate on the edge, on the upgoing edge and the downgoing edge? So you can change it between a flip-flop and a latch. So if you inadvertently click on one of these, your whole circuit might change your behavior. So if weird things are happening, go back and check how your uh, components are set up. The other thing I wanted to mention on, uh, on state machines, the way that, that I've been describing state machines up here, you have um, a flip-flop for each state. Okay, it's state 0, state 1, state 2, state 3. And I've been doing it like that because it corresponds nicely to the way that you draw the uh, state transition diagrams. Okay, and, and <coughs> one flip-flop holding each state. The more common way that you'll see this done, and if you're looking online to try to find some, some background information on state machines, a more common way to do this would be um, so your table might say state input next state. Um, you can take your state and you can represent it as a binary number, so you would have states like 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and you have some inputs and then you have some next states, whatever they might be. Um, you can build this machine with only two flip-flops instead of four. Okay, you can basically use one flip-flop to represent bit 0 of your state and one to represent bit 1 of your state. Okay, if you had 16 states in your machine, you could use four flip-flops to implement all 16 states instead of using 16 flip-flops. Okay? It reduces the number of flip-flops and makes the combinational logic a little harder. Because now if you want to know if you're in state 2, you need to know that this is a 0 and this is a 1. Okay, whereas over here, all we need to know is that there was a 1 coming out of state 2. So more combinational logic, fewer flip-flops. But I was looking online, this seems to be the way that most of the stuff online is, is building state machines. So um, there might be some confusion there, but that's a perfectly valid way to, to um, do the same kind of circuitry. But just so, if you go looking online, you'll see that more than discrete flip-flops like this. All right, so um, on Tuesday we talked about left and right shift, we talked about left and right rotate. And rotate, you take the bit that's coming out from either end and you feed it back into the other end. Shift, you just move and you usually shift in a zero or a one. Um, converting between decimal and binary. Okay, this is something you'll need to do um, fairly often. And one direction is easy, one direction is harder. Okay, that's a binary number. If you want to convert it to decimal, all you need to know is the value of each of those columns. Okay, so this is 1, 2, 4, 8. Okay, so this is 1 plus 2 plus 4 is 7. Okay, plus 0 if you like. If you had another 1, 1 here, it would be plus 16 plus 32. Okay, that direction is straightforward if you're just adding up the powers of ones. The trickier direction is going back from a decimal number into binary. Okay? And there's a trick you can keep in mind to do that. The trick is when you right shift a number, it's kind of like dividing by two, but you lose the lowest bit. Okay, if it's an odd number and that bit is a one, it rounds down when you divide by two because these things are integers. So if you start with a number like um, 55, okay, we know already that that's 
That's what it looks like. Okay, suppose you didn't know that. Well, there's some bit value here, the least significant bit, and you want to find out what that is. If you take this number and you divide it by two and you check to see if there's a remainder or not, that will tell you what this low bit is. Okay, so 55 divided by two is 27 to the remainder of one. Okay, that's your first bit. Now what have you done when you divided this by two? You basically just shifted it over one place. You've eliminated this, because that gets lost in the rounding, and now you have this number divided by two. Okay, well what's in the low bit of this number now? That's the second bit of your binary representation. And it's in this least bit position, so you can do the same thing. You can take 27 divided by two, that's 13 with the remainder of one. Well, that one is this bit right here. That's the second bit of your binary number. And now you shift it again. And you do the same thing. You take 13 divided by 2 is 6 with the remainder of 1. That's your third bit. It's that right there. Now you shift right again, which divides by 2. And you got 6 divided by 2 equals 3 with the remainder of 0. That zero is that bit, so that's the fourth bit of your number. Shift again. You take that three divided by two is one with a remainder of one. That's your fifth bit. And when you shift it one more time, one divided by two is zero with a remainder of one. And that's your last bit. So one, 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 zero, one, one is your number from right to left. Okay, and if you shift it once more, you're just going to end up with zero. And you know that no matter how many more times you shift, every time you divide, you're going to get zero with the remainder of zero. So all your other bits to the left are going to end up being zero. So. That's that one. That's that one. Okay, and that's a general procedure you can use to convert binary convert decimal numbers into binary. You can also just try to guess, but that's not much fun. Okay, so divide by two, check the remainder. Divide by two, check the remainder. Keep going. Put your bits from least significant bit on up to the most significant. Is that good? We have a final uh, one week from today, right? Or not final? A midterm. Yeah. Will we, will we be getting study guides for that? Or? Um, no. <laughs> um, on Tuesday, I'll, I'll come in and I'll talk for a few minutes and just sort of remind you of what we've done. But Tuesday is basically just going to be questions from you, things that you want to see work through, and so on. If we run out of questions, I'm going to go on with a new lecture. So bring a lot of questions. But the midterm is basically going to be like the homework. It's not going to be as. Uh, I mean, it's going to be something you can do in an hour and a quarter, hopefully. Um, Sorry, it was something to step on. This last one, right? Yeah, it goes up through and includes state machines. It does not include arithmetic. Okay, so the midterm is is digital logic, combinational circuits, sequential circuits, flip flops, state machines. That's pretty much it. Um, switches, putting switches together in series or parallel. Um, so things you've seen on the homework are, are pretty typical of the kinds of problems you do. I'm not going to have you build a, a digital implementation of a state machine with 56 states in it or something like that. Um, okay, I promised you a week ago to tell you about two's complement. It's a week later, but I'm going to tell you about it finally. Um, an interesting thing to know is that there are lots of different number systems out there besides the ones that we're used to dealing with on a daily basis. So we deal with um, real numbers and we deal with integers and things like that. And we can do operations on these entities. We can add them, we can multiply them, we can subtract them and so on. And we learned how to do that a long time ago. But those are not the only kinds of number systems out there. Okay, there's an infinite infinitude 
large number of um, other number systems that you can imagine. And some of them have similar properties to the math that we're used to doing, some of them don't. There's an area called discrete math. It's, it's basically an abstraction of the kinds of things that we encounter on a daily basis. Taking parts of those and abstracting to something different from what we encounter on a daily basis and then studying those, these abstract objects, to see what's different, what's similar. Um, we learn that x plus y equals y plus x. Is that always true? Or are there a number of systems where adding two numbers depends on the order of them? And what does that mean if there are? Um, so that discrete math and um, um, abstract algebra, um, interesting areas. And they tie into um, doing binary arithmetic because most of what we're doing in binary arithmetic is what's called modulo n arithmetic. How many people are familiar with modulo n? Okay. Um, so integers, for example, they're positive and negative. We define an addition. If you add two integers, you get an integer. So it's closed under addition. There's a zero element, this magic element called zero. And the reason we call it zero is because it has this property, x plus zero is equal to x. Okay, that's a definition of a zero element. Okay, if there were another number that we could add to x and always get back x, that would be another zero. Okay, there's only one of them under integers, and that's the zero that we know. There's a multiplication operation. You can multiply two integers and you get another integer. So it's closed under multiplication. And we have this really useful property that if x times y is equal to zero, either x is zero or y is zero. Okay, and it's the same zero that we can add to something without changing its value. Okay, that's a set of properties on one set of objects that we call integers with these operations that we call addition and multiplication. In modulo n arithmetic, you have a smaller universe of objects. So for example, modulo 16, you have 16 objects, which we call 0 through 15. And it works very much like regular integers, except if you add two numbers, like if you take 10 plus 8, well, you can't get 18, because 18 is not one of the numbers in our universe. Okay, so it's sort of like 18. Well, what we do is we sort of roll it over at 16. So we say when you get to 16, you go back to 0. So you count 0 up to 15, and 16 is 0, 17 is 1, 18 is 2. So this is actually equal to 2. Okay, 10 plus 8 equals 2. Okay, because there is no 18. That makes sense. So this is... Can you take this last year number? Did you? What class? Can we math? Okay, yeah. <laughs> So it's the same thing. If you add two numbers in this universe and you remember to roll over at 16, you get another number in this universe. Okay, you always get something between 0 and 15. And we still have a 0 element. If you take x and you add 0, it's just equal to x. Okay, and there's a notion of multiplication also. So you can define arithmetic modulo 16. And this is very much what happens when you work in binary with 4-bit numbers. Because if you have a 4-bit number, the range of possible values is exactly that universe from 0 to 15. So I'll put these up once and then I'll try not to erase them. So if you have a 4-bit machine, those are all the integers that you can represent. And that corresponds to the universe of, of uh, modulo 16 number system. And when you do addition, if you just kind of take two numbers and you um, add them together bit by bit, which we talked about before, 0 plus 0 is 0, 1 plus 0 is 1, 0 plus 0 is 0. 1 plus 1 is a 0 with an extra carry of 1. So there'd be a 1 over here, but it's just a 4-bit number, so that doesn't go anywhere. That bit just disappears. And sure enough, when you take 10 and you add 8, you get 2. Okay, so computers are doing modular arithmetic inside.
Okay, so this helps us with negatives because um, you have this fact that, that, for example, 15 plus 1 is 16, that's the same as 0. Okay? And normally we think of negatives as two things that you add together and you get 0. Okay, so x plus negative x equals 0. So since 15 and 1 give us 0, we can think of 15 and 1 as being negatives of each other. And so we sort of adopt this convention that negative 1, we're going to treat the same as 15. And if you do that, things work out really nicely because now when you want to do subtraction, you want to do y minus x. Okay, that's the same as taking y and adding the negative of x. And since we're in modulo 16, you can add 16 to anything and not change its value. So y plus negative x is the same as y plus negative x plus 16. And we can rearrange those two terms, and it's the same as y plus 16 minus x. So since y minus x is the same as y plus 16 minus x, this tells us how to do subtraction. Instead of subtracting x, we can just add 16 minus x, which we decided was going to be how we represented negative x. So what does this look like? cut the range of numbers just about in half. We used to be able to go from 0 to 15. Now we can only go from 0 to 7, but we can also go from negative 1 down to negative 8. You get one extra negative number. I don't know why. Is it 0? Yeah, if you count 0 as positive. If you count it in the middle, it still seems like the negatives are getting something extra. <laughs> So in a 4-bit case, this is how we're going to represent um, negative numbers. And the nice thing is this fact on top. If you want to subtract x, you can just add negative x. So now if you want to do 13 minus 5, well, there's 13. And negative 5 will be 1011. Add those, 1 plus 1 is 0, carry a 1, 1 plus 1 is 0, carry a 1, 1 plus 1 is 0, carry a 1, 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3, okay, which is 1, 1. Again, this is kind of an extra bit that falls off, and this is equal to h. And that's 13 minus 5. We did that without a safety net, so glad it worked. Um, <laughs> So we don't really need a subtraction, okay? We can just add negatives and be able to do both addition and subtraction. And so this is called two's complement.
Okay, then if you continue this, um, you would get a zero and a zero, and then you get H. Thank you. That would have been really confusing later. Okay, so for four bits, the range is from positive seven down to negative eight. Um, quick question, this most significant bit here, Notice a pattern about what value that has? It tells zero. Say again? Um, the one for negative. Zero. Yeah. So what does it correspond to when that most significant bit is a zero? Positive. It's positive. When it's a one, it's negative. Okay, so. Writing down the two's complement version of a number is pretty straightforward. There's a simple two-step procedure. So if you don't want to refer to a table like that for the rest of your life. If you have a number like 5, okay, and you want to know what negative 5 is, you can do two steps. Okay, one, uh, just apply a not operation to complement each of the bits. Okay, so bitwise, not. That's your first step. Second step, just add one. That's negative five. Somebody might sneak in here one of these days and move the tables around too. I just have this feeling. So we'll go back to um, orbit numbers. That's positive one. So what's negative one going to look like? 1,001. Well, you complement all of these. That's a bitwise one, and then you add one. And you get one, 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 one. Mm -hmm. Wait, something cooler? Okay, that's zero. What does negative zero look like? So you complement this, what do you get? Zero, zero, Same thing. Zero. Yeah, you complement it, you get that. Complement. That's how you do. Um, that's one way to do subtraction by adding. Um, that's how you convert from a positive to a negative, and it all works because of modular arithmetic. So your homework will probably have some examples of convert this number to positive or negative, things like that. And this has an effect on. Um, shift operations. When you shift a number to the right, I said it was dividing it by two. So if you have SHR means shift to the right, gives you a 
3, which is half of 6. Okay, so shifting right divides by 2. When you have negative numbers, though, if you shift right, you get positive 4, which isn't what you wanted. So, there's two versions of shifting right. There's the normal version where you just shift a zero in. And then there's this um, other version which we call a signed shift. And in a signed shift, you preserve what this sign bit is. Okay, so let's call it a signed shift right. And instead of shifting in a zero, we would look at this most significant bit, say it's a one. So we're going to shift in a one. And one, one, zero, zero is uh, negative three. That's not right. One one zero zero is negative four. Yeah. Okay, so now you divide negative eight by two and you get negative four. So these signed operations are important when you're doing arithmetic, obviously. If you're doing a logical operation where you're trying to pull off bits from a bit mask or something like that, you probably do an unsigned shift. If you're dealing with integers that are signed, then you want to do a sign shift. And when we start talking about instruction set architectures, you'll see that a lot of operations have two versions. There's a signed version and an unsigned version. And that's the difference is how do they treat that most significant bit? Do they treat it the way you would if this was a, a numeric quantity, or do they treat it the way you would if this was just a set of bits that had no particular meaning? Um, an interesting note here on modular arithmetic, back to uh, modular 16, we've got a notion of multiplication, we've got a notion of zero element. This fact no longer holds. Okay, if x times y is equal to zero, it's possible that x and y are not zero. For example, four times four is equal to zero. Okay, that's kind of a weird thing to bump into. And stuff like this used to trip up um, early mathematicians because they would end up assuming things without realizing they were doing it. I mean, we all know if a times b is zero, a is zero or b is zero, right? But you start working on a different system with different rules and things that you thought were obvious aren't necessarily true anymore. And if you don't realize that things like this can happen, you can get into all kinds of trouble. And a lot of the famous proofs from uh, classic theorems in, in uh, algebra, for example, turn out to be false because people had assumed things that turned out not to be true. Um, and in modular arithmetic, this is one of the things that breaks down, is we no longer have this notion that um, non-zero things cannot give you zero. Okay, having said that, if you go into modulo 17, that property holds again. The only time x times y is zero is if x is zero or y is zero. So what's the difference between 16 and 17? Yeah, 17 is prime. Okay. Same reason as cicadas. You get cicadas out here? There were some, there were some in like Oregon. And yeah? Okay. They were, they were a big feature growing up back east. Every 17 years, some of them are 13 years, millions of these things just pop out of the ground and they climb up in trees and they make this amazing buzzing sound. It's all you can hear. It's like deafening. And they live for, I think, a few weeks. They mate. They drop down into the ground. The, small larvae go into the ground and they sit there for 17 more years and then they come out again. And some of these occur with a periodicity of 17 years, some of them occur with a periodicity of 13 years, some of the periodicity of 7 years. Those are all prime numbers. Okay, There's good reasons why it works that way. Um, there's, there's speculation as to what the actual reason is. Um, but one consequence of this is what are the chances that all three of these species will emerge in the same year? How often is that going to happen? It's going to happen every 17 times 13 times 7. Okay, that's like 1,000 years or something. <laughs> okay, very unlikely. Whereas if they had periodicities of, you know, 8 and 4 and 2, well, every 8 years possibly they would all appear, or they may be off cycle with each other. And maybe this comes out on odd years and this on even years, and they never occur at the same time. Um, 
the fact that these are prime ensures that there will be times when they all pop out in the same year, but that they're going to be really far in between. Okay, prime numbers are good things. All right, back to binary. So binary is boring. <laughs> He gets tired of writing ones and zeros, and zeros and ones. So we have. Um, there's a binary number. Okay. There's other ways you can write this. Um, one of the older ways to do this was a system called octal, and in octal you basically have eight digits, and they look just like zero through seven. I don't have to rewrite them. Um, so much fun. Yeah. So in octal, you look at these three bits, that's a five. You look at these three bits, that's a three. You look at these bits, and that's a three. And so you could write this number as three, three, five. And to tell people it's an octal, you put a little eight down here. Tell them it's base eight. Okay. And it works exactly like binary. We're just using powers of eight instead of powers of two. Okay. You can add and subtract and all kinds of things like that, the same way you do in decimal or that you do in binary. There's different rules. When you write a binary number, you can put a little 2 next to it to say that it's binary, as opposed to being a decimal number that just happens to have all ones and zeros. Okay, hexadecimal um, is base 16. So, we just switch to letters of the alphabet. A through F or 10 through 16. And what that lets you do is let's, it lets you group these things in sets of four. Remember, four bits is a nibble. It's a very common um, chunking of, of binary bits for a lot of reasons. Okay, things break out into four bits nicely. So in hexadecimal, you would take those four bits, one, one, zero, one, that's a D. And Okay, so that would just be DD. And sometimes you put an X down here, or sometimes you write 0X in the beginning, DD. Or I suppose you could write a little 16 on the bottom. This is sort of probably the most standard way to do it now. Um, and programming languages like C understand that syntax. So you can put on accessible numbers into your program. And this is the number that the representation that you find when you look at your MAC ID on your uh, network card. That's a series of um, hexadecimal digits. Okay, so um, four bits per hex digit. So when you find two of them, that's just a good old 8-bit number. MAC IDs have six of those, so that's a 48-bit address. Okay, network addresses have four 8-bit um, numbers. So this is the one that you always get in your router by default. Um, Eight hex digits, 32 bits. Okay, how many possible network addresses are there? Not enough. Not enough. <laughs> All right. So, um, two to the 32 is approximately one billion. Sorry, four billion. Okay. Um, useful ones to remember: two to the 10 is approximately one k. Okay, it's actually 1,024, close enough to 1,000. So an easy way to just sort of like put these things in your head, 2 to the 10th is 1K. 2 to the 20th would be 1K squared, which is about 1 meg. And 2 to the 30th is about 1 gig. Okay, 2 to the 31st is about 2 gig. And 2 to the 32 is 4 gig. Okay, that other camera I had in here that I was trying to record with had a two gigabyte file size limit. Okay. And it's because if you're doing signed arithmetic, the large deposit number you can get to is around two billion. And lots of things broke at the two gigabyte limit. Okay, some of the old Windows machines, the largest hard drive you could put in was two gigabytes. Okay, and then you had to start doing special tricks to get the larger drive in until the operating system caught up. 
So yeah, network addresses were limited to four billion, and, and we've run out. Um, and this is why nine at six is being pushed because it's a uh, six um, six pairs of hex digits instead of four. So um, back to the realm of Mac IDs, forty eight bits gives you more reading room. But for now, we've kind of run out. And dead beat is a real hex number. You'll find it in lots of programs sometimes. <laughs> All right, um, so we've skipped talking about um, a detail when we do arithmetic, which is overflow. And overflow is this idea that we're working modulo, say, 16, and so there's a limit to how big your numbers can be. So if we're talking about signed integers, okay, so plus and negative, two's complement, um, Six and five. If you try to add these together, you get a one, one, one and one is zero, you carry a one, and that gives you a one. Okay, technically this is the number eleven, but it's not because we're in two's complement. Okay, so this is actually it's negative five. Yeah. Okay, you need to know that when you added these numbers, you got a result that's not what you think it is. And it's pretty easy to do this. When you're doing addition, if you're adding two positive numbers, okay, so the sign bits are both zero, and the result is a sign bit that's one, you know you got an overflow. Because basically, you're adding your numbers, you're getting bigger, and you went beyond this border, and you flipped over into the negative realm. Okay, and that's what that one tells you. So when you're adding two positives, if your sign bit changes to a one, you know you got an overflow. Okay, same exact thing, if you were adding two negative numbers and your sign bit ended up being zero, you know you got an overflow. So when you add, all you have to do is look at the sign bit and if it's changed, then you know that your number is too big. Okay, and you can't represent it. If you add a positive and a negative, you can't get overflow. Okay? And you can sort of work through the extreme cases, but... Um, Adding a positive and negative, you're basically subtracting one number from another. And from a seven, the smallest result you can get would be um, adding negative eight, which would bring you down to negative one. Okay? Anyway, you can work through the cases, but overflow is impossible if your sign bits are different. In subtraction, it's the opposite case. If you're taking a positive minus a negative, that's just like adding two things together, and so you can look for a sign bit change. Um, same with a negative and a plus. If you subtract a positive from a positive, you can't get overflow. Yeah? If you're subtracting a positive and a negative, how do you know what the sign bit should be? The one that's on top? I think it's the one that's on top. Let's find out. So, positive one is negative. Basically what you're doing is you're taking this number and you're adding a positive one to it.
when you take a positive and you subtract a negative, you're really just taking a positive and you're adding something to it. So we're back in that first case where you're doing addition. Okay, you're adding um, two things, and so you're looking for two positive things. So you're looking for a sign of change. In other words, five minus negative one. That's the same as five plus. Positive five minus negative one is the same as positive five plus positive one. Okay, it's the same case where we're adding two positives. And so we need the result to be positive. And the same goes if it's minus, minus, and plus. Um, a different representation, we're not going to do a lot on this, but um, there's a system called binary coded decimal. And this used to be more popular. It still has its place. So for example, if you wanted the number 32767, okay, in binary, that's um, 0 followed by a bunch of 1s. Okay. Ones followed by zero. Okay. In binary coded decimal, the way you would write this number is you take a seven and you say that's zero one one one. You take a six and that's zero one one zero. Seven is zero one one one. Two is zero zero one zero. Three is zero zero one one. That's the binary coded decimal representation of that number. Okay, very different from pure binary. So each number on top gets four? Each number on top gets four bits. Okay, that's one of the places where nibbles come in. Um, this is a handy representation because it's very fast to convert between binary and decimal. Okay, you don't need to go through and multiply and add when you're going from binary to decimal. You don't need to do all this division and keeping track of your remainders to go from decimal into binary. You can just sort of directly go from digits to binary and back and forth. That's very useful. Okay? It's useful in particular if you're trying to do arithmetic on numbers with huge numbers of bits. So there's, there's libraries out there you can use if you want to do arithmetic computations on numbers with millions of digits. Okay, like you want to print out the largest known prime, for example. Um, it's very easy to take your numbers in and out using this kind of representation. The arithmetic is a little bit trickier because when you add things, for example, 7, um, seven plus 4, normally you would get um, that, which looks like 11. You need to have some logic in your circuitry that says, no, this is actually supposed to be equal to 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay, a 1 followed by a 1. So the circuitry for doing arithmetic is a little more complex, but the input-output operations and the fact that you can extend this out to as many bits as you want without having to um, change your algorithm makes it uh, useful for um, doing large arithmetic, arithmetic on large numbers. And things like COBOL um, support binary coded decimal in the language. Um, the original VAX had um, instructions that dealt with BCD numbers, so you could do arithmetic on them at the uh, assembly language level and so on. Um, you don't see a lot of BCD anymore, but it's still useful in places. Uh, let's talk about a bit of hardware. How do you actually do this arithmetic in hardware? Um, so, if you want to add two bits, okay, A and B, you can write down a truth table. So. If you add 0 and 0, you get a sum of 0. 0 and 1 is 1, 1 and 0 is 1. If 
you add one and one, you get an overflow, right? So you get a zero with this extra bit coming out that we consider to be an overflow. So we create this carry bit. Okay, this is a carry coming out of your operation. And we say the sum of one and one is zero, but the carry out is a one. In these cases, there are no overflows, so the carry is a zero. Okay, this is the basic block here. This is called a half adder. So a half adder lets you add two bits together and it potentially, potentially produces this overflow condition. We can define a full adder. Because remember when you add in binary, if you get a one coming out, if you get an overflow, you need to carry it over into the next bit position. So we need to be able to take in this one that's carrying over from the previous bit. So a full adder has three inputs, A, B, and a carry in. And then it has a sum output, and it has a carry out. looks just like if you just write down some binary numbers and start adding right one plus one without a carry in gives you a zero and you have this extra carry one plus one gives you a zero with this extra carry one plus one plus one you put a one down here and you have another carry generated one plus zero plus zero gives you a one with no carry. One plus one gives you a zero with a carry of one. Okay, and there's our sum. So that's just a truth table describing how you add binary numbers normally, just bit by bit. Okay, and this is a full adder. If you want to make a half adder, um, how can we represent the sum in terms of A and B? What's the logical expression for that? I don't want to do K maps and all of that, I'm being lazy. So, how could I write the sum in terms of A and B? XOR. XOR. sum is A, X, or B, and your carryout is just A and B. And if you want to make a full adder, you can basically take two half adders and put them together. So you can take your sum and you can add your carry into it and generate your new sum, and you can take your um, 
let me show you a circuit for that. It's easier. Can I erase this? sum of these two bits this is the carry coming out of adding these two bits. Now if you have a carry coming in that you want to incorporate, you can take the sum that you started off with, you can add the carry in. That'll give you your 